Uh, a warm welcome to Manangal. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the people who are joining us today from different parts of the world. We are about to begin our session on the topic to EDP and not to EDP by not only one speaker but three of them. I would like to welcome today's panel consists of Mr. Sheikh Rizan, Mr. Adam Yas Chinzen, and Mr. Azra. A warm welcome to the event, you all. Thank you, guys. Okay, so as an introduction, I would like to speak a few words about our panel today. Mr. Adam uh, is a penetration tester in a BA system based in Malaysia and has five plus years of experience in the field of cybersecurity. He is responsible for delivering red teaming exercises and various penetration tests in the numerous industries and important critical vulnerabilities in their applications. And infrastructure. He was pressed CRT, OSCP, CEH, and CRTO industry certifications. Apart from projects, he also contributed to the Grandi Program for Health and Financial Industries and Vulnerability Structures Program for Internet Spaces. I welcome you. Uh, I welcome Sir you to today's session. Uh, Mr. Rasan is a passionate information security professional with more than 20 years of experience. He loves anything Linux and open source. He has spent over 13 years securing one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world from cyber threats. And he also holds several industry re relevant certifications, including OSCP, OSCE, OSWE, CISSP, and CRESC CRT. I welcome you to the session, sir. Uh, Mr. Azrul started his journey in cybersecurity in his early teens, where he found a flow in and dial up internet access, and people can serve the internet for free. Since that, he developed interest in hacking. He believes that hacking is not just a career, but a way of life. His current work involves identifying security vulnerabilities and conduct ethical hacking software application. Throughout his career, he has performed various penetration tests and numerous agencies, especially in major banking of Southeast Asia to ensure that their systems are more secure against cyber criminals. He spent his free time in the laboratory to hunt for a new CD and zero day. I welcome three of you to this session. Uh, you can Alright, thank you. I'm going to share my screen really quick. And I assume everyone can see my screen. Okay, let's start. Sorry, a few slides up. <laughs> okay, there we go. So we are from BAE Systems. Um, our presentation today is on the topic of VDP. It's to VDP or not to VDP. I'm going to talk a bit more about the motivations, the success, and our failures. Um, three of us over here, I guess you know enough about us, so I'm going to skip this slide. Let's move into the agenda. The introduction, I'll speak a bit. Um, the research, selection of our VDP targets. This is the part where um, I'll run through a few slides. And then um, I will pass the, um, the floor to my colleagues, both um, Azrul and Aiden, to talk about the technical findings of what they have found, uh, the vulnerabilities in the respective VDP programs. And once they're done, um, I'll speak about the learnings. So the learnings are quite important. Um, our trials, our success, and our failures in uh, participating in uh, vulnerability disclosure programs. All right, so um, introduction on what is a VDP. Now, many of you have heard about this, vulnerability disclosure programs. There are plenty of them out there. Um, basically, it's a program that creates uh, a platform for white hat hackers to um, submit um, security vulnerabilities to an organization without getting in trouble, right? Uh, it, it helps the organization to mitigate risk and uh, enable responsible disclosure. Now, there is a slight difference between a VDP and a BBP program. So many of you have heard about BBPs, bug bounty programs, such as HackerOne, BugCrowd, um, Integrity, uh, Yes We Hack, and so forth. So this has been a very famous or uh, very popular um, platforms um, to do ethical hacking. Now, the main difference I would like to point out about a BBP program 
um, other than having yeah, um, an avenue for white hat hackers to uh, report security vulnerabilities, um, it's an avenue for people to earn money. Now, when we talk about compensation, um, it always involves um, more people, uh, more competition. There are full-time hackers uh, looking at BBP programs. Therefore, we decided not to get involved in BBP at this point of time, mainly because, um, firstly, um, our motivations are not monetary. Um, we are doing this as part of the uh, BAE uh, Vulnerability Research Program. Um, we are already paid uh, a full-time job, and our full-time job is not um, security research. We, we are full-time pen testers. Yeah? But the reason that we, we want to do BBPs are different than most people. All right, all right. Um, let, let me tell you about the, the background on why we want to do it, uh, why we chose uh, BDPs. So in this slide, all I want to make clear is that for a BBP program, it's more competitive, mainly because there are compensation, monetary compensation. And we decided not to, uh, to pursue BBPs, but rather pursue VDPs, vulnerability disclosure programs, where we don't obtain uh, compensation, but mainly recognition. So why the VDPs? Why did we participate? Why did we select or why did we opt for VDPs? Because we are full-time pen testers, um, when we don't have projects, in between projects, we chose to do VDPs. Is to mainly sharpen our pen testing skills. So it's an avenue for us to apply our pen testing skills in a VDP environment. There are slight differences there, but mainly we report on the business impact. So we don't report on, on silly um, uh, vulnerabilities like a weak SSL or a weak cipher or missing HTTP headers. We report on the ones that have huge business impact, which some of it, um, my friends will, will show you in the following slides. Secondly, um, BBPs are a bit too competitive. I did uh, mention that. There are just a lot of hackers out there doing this full time and we are not out to compete with them but we are out to complement them. Um, we also wish to target um, programs that are open source in nature, that are freely available for people out there to use. Therefore, by helping them, we make a positive impact in the cybersecurity community. We help to give back to the community by reporting security volunteers, by doing code audit for them for free. And another reason why we want to do this is to mainly attract talent to uh, retain staff to avoid burnout because a lot of us we we are just we are full time pen testers. Um, all we do is pen test um, five days a week, and participating in VDPs is one way for us to to get some recognition from the community, um, to refresh our skills, to learn new skills, to collaborate, and to apply our pen testing skills in a research environment. So these these are the reasons why we chose VDP over BBPs. Mainly because, um, also another reason uh, I have to say is because if we obtain um, any monetary compensation from a program, we, we do not accept it um, on, on behalf of the company. We would have to donate the money, uh, mainly because we, we have full-time jobs and um, it's, um, it, it's not in line with, with our, our, our company's um, uh, motto um, to to you know to, to make money our BBPs is is not our core function. So our core function is to do penetration testing for organizations. But at the same time, we have a vulnerability research team that actively applies our pen testing skill into VDP programs. Right. Now this is a very important topic: how to choose your VDP targets because we have very limited time. Um, perhaps like um, five days or less in a month when, when we don't have projects, when, when we are free to, to do VDPs. Yeah? So it's not that we, we, we have a lot of amount of time. So we have to analyze our VDP scope carefully. <clears throat> Usually I will go through the VDP programs that are available out there on the internet. I will check carefully if the programs or the scope are not too restrictive they, they are in line with our, our company's uh, policy, um, you know, nothing illegal, um, you know, then we proceed, 
right? And also, we we will check with our internal um, uh, guidelines to to make sure that we you know we do not cross any uh, any legal boundaries, right? So all this come with analyzing the the scope, and most of the time, I tell my guys to avoid the online applications, web applications. Um, you know, in in BBP programs, usually they say, all right, um, you can you are free to hack. Um, abc.com anything within the the domain of abc.com um and i usually avoid online web applications even for vdp programs because it is just too easy um the entry level is too easy um they are just they 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 are very likely to have um duplicates and if we report something you know another security researcher would have already found it and that that moves me to to the third point where I usually try to choose applications that require on-prem installations, such as CMS, Content Management System, where we have to download the application, install it, you know, on, on our virtual machines, and and, and uh, perform the testing there. So that has um a bit raises the bar a bit because the entry level is more um, difficult in the sense that I believe that. If the effort to um, set up the application is is more, therefore it is very likely that it has not been thoroughly pen tested by by casual researchers. Yeah, because a lot of researchers out there um, who want to make a, a quick buck or maybe a, a, a quick uh, win would rather go for something that's avail- readily available, that's already installed, you know, like an online app, web application. You just Turn on burp suite and, and start burping and, and look for bugs. But I I avoid that because of duplicates. Yeah. So we install the application and and, and we tweak it and 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 then we, we conduct the testing there. And very important, when you choose a VDP program, I make sure that the VDP program is active. This is very important, huh? So I will look at the history of the program to see if there were bugs reported. Um was the was the program responsive to the um, to the researchers? Did they reply? Were there any open disclosures? Were there any CVEs applied? You know, if I see there are historical figures of CVEs being uh, given for security researchers that have found the bugs that have been reported, that's good. That 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 is what I'm looking for because ultimately we also want the CVEs, and we have made a couple of uh, CVEs. In fact, um, a few of them are still pending uh, the, um, the, the rollout of, of the patches. So it, it's not uh, the CVEs are not ready yet. But um, since we started, we, we have uh, actively uh, found uh, and uh, registered a couple of CVEs. And I also avoid VDPs that are too restrictive. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to turn on a VPN. Uh, you can only scan a small subnet of our network. Uh, you, 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 you know, I'm looking for a certain, a, a certain a particular uh, vulnerability, you, you know, XSS is out of scope, blah, blah, blah. I, just too restrictive. I, know, I, I want something that um, the guys are freely available. Uh, I mean, uh, the guys are, are, are able to report all kinds of bugs. It, it can be uh, SQL injection to XSS to, to anything that has a business impact. Yep. Um, of course, the most imp- uh, another very important point at the bottom here is to avoid VDPs that are not responsive. Um, the w- worst case scenario we have come upon is when we report a vulnerability and the VDP program goes quiet. Um, they don't respond. They don't say, yes, thank you. We have received your email. We are looking, nothing like that. And the worst, uh, worst outcome we had was they fixed the bug, but they did not acknowledge us for it. <laughs> so that's, that's really bad. <laughs> so avoid those kind of programs at all costs. Now I'm going to move on to the technical findings. Um, so in the technical findings, um, we, we have chosen a couple of products. Um, unfortunately, we can't talk about all the VDP programs that we have um, found bugs in, right? Um, some of them did not allow uh, public disclosure. Um, some of them were pending patch rollout. Um, at least 40% of them are, are still pending patch rollout. So the ones that we can talk about um, on display here, um, this has, uh, we have already um, um, spoken to the uh, VDP owners and told them that we will be presenting these findings in, in uh, a Red Team Summit and they, they were happy about it. 
So th- thankfully, you know, we had some uh, program owners that were okay with us talking about the program. <laughs> so we have Kirby CMS, um, Craft CMS, Go CMS. A lot of CMSs. Uh, we we chose CMS as as a starting platform uh, mainly because this is the first year that DAE Systems uh, AI uh, has uh, undertaken the, the the VR project. And I didn't want to make it too difficult for our, for our pen testers to to move into VR. So we we said, mm, yeah, CMS is kind of easy in a way because it's web based. Um, we do a lot of uh, uh, web application pen testing, so it's the, the learning curve is is you know is, is pretty easy for us. And as you can see, uh, Go CMS is not exactly um uh how do I say. Uh, we have 10,000 paying subscribers. Yeah, it's a widely used application, but it's not as popular as, for example, uh, WordPress. Yeah, WordPress is way bigger. Um, so I, I chose something in between. Um, we don't want to have something that is too popular or something that is not used at all by anyone, and then you know it's a waste of time. So by choosing your VDP targets um, carefully, you know, choosing choosing your 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 program carefully, uh, you are more likely to find something. Right, that opposed than, than going for something that's too popular, and you come out empty-handed. Right, so because we want to show that uh, we want to show to management that look, we have invested X amount of time, and we can come out with results. And uh, with, with goals, uh, we we found a couple of um, uh, vulnerabilities which uh, my colleague will talk about later on how he found those vulnerabilities, and um, yeah, for Craft and Kirby too. Right, so Craft and Kirby, you can see the the number of users here. Yeah, they they they're pretty popular. Um, 150k uh, websites created u- uh, using Craft CMS. So whatever vulnerabilities we report to, we, we report to them uh, would have an impact on on these uh, users out there. All right. So um, without me um, spending too much time, I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm going to pass the baton to my colleague, Aiden. Hi everyone. Okay. Is my screen is full screen? My slide. Okay. Hello, can you see my slide? Yes, I can, Aiden. Um uh, Okay, I think it should be all right. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Aiden. So, it's, it's my honor to be invited to talk about my finding in the Red Team Summit. So, I am going to share my findings that I discovered in the Go CMS. Go CMS is a free and open source uh, blogging platform for users to publish their individual blog and the uh, epic. And the application is written in the Node.js. According to the Ghost website, they have uh, over 2.5 million users globally, and they are accept the VDP. That is why we choose this uh, uh, CMS as our target. And I discovered the finding on Ghost version 4.9.1. We can call the finding either as a previous escalation or the broken access control. This allows a user can access to the admin level setting and the API keys. And the finding is require any type of the authenticated user in order to exploit. Uh, the method of the exploitation, first, we need to understand the permission of each user roles on the application. So this is more preferable. We, we can do it on the whiteboard testing as it will save us a lot of time. Second, this type of uh, vulnerability cannot be identified by the automa- automation tool because the tool don't have the intelligence to differentiate the user roles on the application. So we are required to discover all the endpoints within the application, especially for the ME modules. Then we, we will manually identify and look for the broken access control endpoints. Uh, <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, that we need to understand the permission of each user role. As we can see from the left, I have created a multiple user role from, from low to high. The highest privilege is an owner, and the lowest privilege is a contributor. On the right side, 
for my confirmation of each user role's permission, I have found uh, goals documentation on their site that show that uh, user roles and the permission metrics. As we can see from the metrics, only admin threader is allowed to view the general site setting. But for other user roles, including contributor and author and auditor and non authenticated user, can cannot be accessed to this uh, uh, views general setting. However, this is not the case based on my research. So let's start with the POC. This is how the goals uh, admin dashboard looks like. I named the application as a vulnerability research. Please pay attention on the URL that I highlighted. So when I try to browse to another modules called a uh, general setting, as we can see from the URL, the far part is, is remaining the same stretch goals. It will be the same if we browse to another module as well. The only difference is the hashtag reference. The hashtag reference is the client side page refer reference for referring to the header session purpose. Uh, it did not consider as a real far path of the application. There was something processed on the back that we cannot see by our naked eyes. Um, so in order for us to find discover the real path, we require a proxy to call per suite. So this is the extension tool for web security testing. I believe maybe some of you may use it before, but there are another way and two can be done the same thing as two. So in my bus suite policy, I captured all the HTTP requests before sending it to the server. As we can see, as we can see, uh, the key finding here is the admin setting endpoint that I highlighted. Actually, the endpoint can be discovered using the inspect element on the browser too, but it may not go as uh, using a proxy tool because the proxy tool is much easier to analyze the endpoint. Now we have the endpoint that we captured just now. What we need to do next is very simple. We open the, another browser, log into the application as a lowest press user. In this case, I use a contributor. Then what we need to do is very simple. We just need to browse to the endpoint that we found in the bus suite earlier. Then we were able to see the general setting info in the JSON format. So this is how it looks like in the JSON format for the general setting info from the admin. So just to prove it on the POC, the left side actually is the admin session and the right side is the contributor. So looking at the setting on the right side, we can see there is a private site clear that password from the admin modules. But on the right side, on the JSON response, from the contributor session, we can see the same thing too. And we can see the another info from the setting as well. Um, I will go into show a few more samples. So this is the Go CMS custom integration uh, for external user to access to the application. And from here, we can see there is some API key here. And on the right side, we can see the content API and the admin API key too. It's the same value as showing in the admin. So as we can see that we were able to view all the API keys and attacker could abuse those key to access to the application. This is another sample that the integration of the third party APIs service called Stripe for the membership payment purpose. Just now we are showing the uh, the, the custom uh, integration for the Go CMS, but this one is for the third party. Also in the in the JSON response for uh, JSON response from the contributor, as we can see, the strike key value here, but in this case is none because I did not connect to the strike. So this is just for the PLC purpose. 
actually there are a lot more of the third-party integration API key can be viewed from this vulnerability. As we can see, there is a slab and the MP and other so on. But in the right side, we can view all those API key settings also. So those are the info here. From the goals, uh, from the goals website show that they allow more than a hundred type of the uh, API integration. Uh, as we can see, they are the PayPal and the GitHub. This is very really dangerous as an attacker could potentially abuse those API key for any malicious intention. Um, just to have a summary of my findings, uh, based on the analysis from the B week, they are currently have uh, around 40k live website uh, using Ghost, as, uh, Ghost CMS right now. So the reference can be uh, viewed from this uh, B week site. So it is a good target as they have a VTP and they are very responsive for any vulnerability submission. I will tell this more in the next slide. The benefit of identifying the access control vulnerability in the open source application, as I mentioned earlier, we can create different user rules as we want, or reviewing the source code to identify the broken access control issue because we own the whole we own the whole environment. So this is the timeline for the finding submission. Uh, in July 14, I submitted the bug to the ghost and they acknowledged our submission in two days. They only took four days to fix the bug and release the new version 4.10. Which is fast, I believe this is due to the impact of the issue. And they also created the security advisory for my issue in their GitHub repo and credit to my name and my company name. So in September, the uh, the CV was published and later on, I published the POC of this filing, which you can find in the reference link here. And then that's it for my, I will pass it to Azru. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, you can see my screen. Okay. Uh, now we will present our finding in the craft CMS. Uh, uh, based on the their website, they are currently have one K plus. Uh, they are use a uh, craft CMS. Uh, they also uh, has a vulnerability disclosure program, which means that this this uh, CMS is a good target because they have a VDP program. On last uh, 34 September 2021, uh, we found uh, CSV injection in this uh, CMS that affected uh, version 3.4 until 3.7.13. And uh, this vulnerability was patched in the version 3.7.14. Uh, a bit of introduction of this uh, vulnerability. Uh, there is a CSV injection vulnerability in this uh, CMS. Uh, authenticated attacker uh, may exploit uh, this vulnerability uh, via a title parameter that is uh, mishandled in a CSV as well in the asset module and can execute a uh, arbitrary command to the victim uh, device. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we will show you the proof of concept. Okay. Uh, if uh, the application has export files uh, to CSV module, it may vulnerability to this issue, which means that if any web application uh, that has like export to a CSV file, right, then we can uh, exploit uh, this uh, vulnerability. Uh, they, they might be vulnerable to this vulnerability. Okay, uh, following input can be used to demonstrate this attack, which means that uh, this pay, this simple payload, uh, once we inject in, into the Excel CSV file, right, and uh, when the user open the spreadsheet application, it will uh, pop up a a calculator application and we also can change uh, to the powershell command or any os command which means that uh, this uh, we can use a calculator or powershell or anything okay uh the first thing is uh 
when we go to the application right we need to log in uh, as admin and go to the asset page okay in the asset page we can see uh, that uh, there is a export uh, functionality export button uh, then uh, when uh, we uh, press the export button right then there, uh, we need to key in the title and then from here we can actually test the uh, csv injection payload we need to inject in here in title parameter and then when we inject the csv injection payload and when we uh, when, when we want to export the file right we need to choose uh, export the asset as uh, csv which means that we need to choose csv only and then when when, when we press uh, export right Okay, uh, as soon as the file get open in uh, Microsoft Excel, the program calculator is open, which means that if the CSV load successfully embedded in the uh, in the Excel file, when the user uh, open this uh, Excel file, the, the CSV payload will get executed. Like here is the example of the calculator program will get executed. Okay, and uh, this is the summary of uh, this uh, attack. It's around, uh, based on their website, it's around 150k plus sites created with Craft SMS. And they also uh, provided a quality disclosure program, which means that uh, this is a good target. And uh, if the application has export file to CSV module, it may be vulnerable to CSV injection. This, uh, this uh, vulnerability occur when a website embed untrusted input inside CSV file. Yeah, list of CSV injection, you can refer to the payload or the things GitHub because they have a number of payload that you can use to test this uh, vulnerability. Okay, uh, this is the timeline for this uh, submission. Uh, we first found uh, this issue on last September and, and then we submitted uh, this issue to Craft and on the next three days, uh, they acknowledged the issue that their response is very fast, like, and then there's they feed it in the on the same day, and they on the next two days, uh, they awarded us with a uh, fifty USD bounty, which means that we not only get uh, CVE, they also awarded us with uh, money, and on last uh, October, uh, they issue a CVE for us for this issue, so you can see more uh, on their website. Okay, uh, the network was, uh, we will present about uh, issue in uh, Kirby CMS. Uh, so we uh, we found a store cross-site scripting in this uh, Kirby CMS in the version uh, 3.5 until 3.5.7.1. And it, it uh, they patched uh, the vulnerability in uh, 3.5.8 and we found the vulnerability in the in July. And this is uh, some of the parameters that affected with the store cross-site scripting, which means that Actually, there, there is uh, other parameter also, but they already sanitized uh, the cross-site scripting payload. But there is some parameter that is still uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to, uh, to this attack. Okay, how I found it. Okay, uh, an authenticated user that has access to panel uh, can inject uh, this uh, cross-site scripting payload when uh, they want to add a new image okay for for example uh, at here uh, we need to go to the panel and we, when here uh, there is a add image button so we need to press uh, add image button and we need to upload any image uh, as shown in in the fig, uh, figure below and after that uh, when we want we upload the photo right uh, we need to inject the cross site scripting payload here uh, there is uh, some escape here and then uh, when we uh, press uh, submit, uh, the, the cross-site uh, scripting payload will get executed every time the user uh, visited the page that containing the malicious image, which means that if if the page containing the, the image, right, the payload will get executed. Okay, uh, the next one is... Uh, we target Kirby SMS because uh, it's a good target as uh, they have a VDP program and the, we need to find any user input in the application and check if it is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Image title also has a possibility to vulnerable to us, which means that we need also, we can also test that like, we can uh, we change the image title to the cross-site. We need uh, like it may vulnerable to cross-site scripting. 
So uh, this is the timeline of the issue. Uh, on last July, we submitted uh, the issue to Kirby and on the next day, they acknowledged the issue and they also quite fast their response. Like only took one day for them to acknowledge the issue and they fit the issue on the same day uh, on their demo server because they also have demo server online and on uh, last uh, November, on last, last Monday, uh, they fixed the release on the major apps version 3.5.8. And on the next day, uh, two CVE was a uh, work issue for uh, this uh, finding, which means that for this uh, store process scripting, uh, we got two CVE for uh, this issue. For the first one is this uh, 58. Uh, the next one is the 50, 52. Okay, uh, so I will pass uh, my presentation to Rizan. Hello there. All right, so as you can see, the, the technical findings made by uh, Azro and Aiden are pretty much common security vulnerabilities that we see in, um, in any pen test uh, project that we do, um, from cross-site scripting to authorization IDOR. Um, we, we even had some uh, RCEs, but unfortunately, we, we can't talk about it. So uh, some, some of the success stories that, that we had over here, uh, for Kirby, we had at least two CVEs issued for our findings for Ghost at least one for craft one and for the others, for example, an online shopping mobile application. This is an Android application uh, where we found uh, vulnerabilities in there. Um, we were given a uh, private acknowledgement, but again, unfortunately, um, the program owner did not allow us to disclose the exact vulnerability. Um, same goes for the online shopping mobile application in the US. Uh, we found a very critical bug that impacted a huge number of users. Unfortunately, again, we were not allowed to even talk about it or mention which online store it belongs to. It's very famous. <laughs> um, and we, we have a couple more, um, Open MRS and um, Gra uh, Grave uh, CMS. Um, unfortunately, we also can't talk about this because the, it's pending a patch rollout right now. Um, we tried to, to um, make it, I mean, they, they tried to make it um, before the, this, this presentation. Unfortunately, uh, it, it took them a while more to, to fix the problem. So um, due to the um, disclosure, the, the responsible disclosure um, process that we agreed, um, we won't be able to talk about this until they had um, fully patched the systems. Um, we also have some IoT uh, vulnerabilities that we have discovered. Um, again, we can't talk about this. Um, and uh, Open EMR. Um, it's out there to uh, multiple patches um, pending uh, 2022. So as you see, um, going into VDPs, uh, it's not that difficult. Yeah, um, You don't have to be a security researcher. Uh, we are not security researchers. We, we are mainly pen testers. And doing VDPs are very similar to pen testing. And in fact, if someone were to ask me, a, a fresh graduate that wants to get into pen testing, ask me, how do I get into pen testing? If you ask me, this is one of the avenue, right? This, this is the best way because other than playing CTFs or you know going for certification, some certification courses are very expensive. We don't expect a student to fork out one thousand USD to sit for OSCP. You know, uh, if you can, it's good. But there are many ways to to get your feet wet, and one of it is to start hunting in VDP programs. There's so many out there. Choose your target wisely, like like I mentioned. Um, you know, look look for high impact bugs. Um, even a 17 year old kid, I, I I know can do it. You know, it's it's not rocket science. is is a matter of whether you you have the interest and the will to learn something new, right? It, it's a great way for for anyone, um, beginners or even uh, advanced users to sharpen their skills in in finding bugs. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend to work in a team. Um, if, if you're not a full-time pen tester or you're not into pen testing, find a group of friends who, uh, who are interested in, in uh, doing uh, bug hunting. And instead of jumping into BBPs where they are so competitive, go for VDPs where they are less competitive and more likely that you will find a valid bug and hopefully score a CVE. And scoring CVEs are really good. It's a good way to show that you uh, your, um, acknowledge your, your skill set that you you know you have found something in the wild in in, in real life in, in in production as opposed to just having a, a security certification where you know I can study I can learn I can pass an exam 
but how do you apply your skills in real life? So if you can show that, you know, I have done, you know, I found CVEs in a couple of products that speaks a lot about your uh, research and your pen testing skills. So work as a team and uh, yeah, hopefully you, you will be, you'll be successful. Just um, keep learning and don't give up. And that's all for us. Um, we are more than happy to take any questions at all. Um, uh, we can try to answer them to our best of our knowledge. I see some questions in the Q and A. Um, I'm going to read them out. Usually, how do you know where or who to find the email to submit or escalate the issue? All right, this is a good question. So, when when you before you start a program, um, I, I always Google for keywords like VDP, Vulnerability Disclosure Programs, and they will come out with a lot of listings. All right, and I think there are some websites that actually have a curated list of VDPs. I, I can't remember the top of my, on my head, but I know they are. So when there is a VDP program, for example, you have a university like Stanford University, Oxford University, um, all these Ivy League universities in the US, they have VDPs too, yeah? Uh, but their VDPs are, uh, the target platform is mainly uh, their website, which is a bit, like I said, it's a bit difficult because the entry level is quite, um, quite easy for, for researchers. But inside the program, they will mention that if you have any bugs, you found any bugs, please report it to so-and-so at this email address. So it's pretty clear. If they do not have an escalation focal point in the VDP program, it's not worth to pursue. You're just wasting your time because you, you, you do not know who to, to submit the bugs and you're sure that you know, it, it's just a wasted effort. Second uh, question. Is every software got their VDP program? No, not, not every software have VDP program. So this is something you got to be very careful. Yeah. If you, you know, there, there is a popular software out there, um, you know, 10,000 users, 10 million users on, on the Android app store or something. And, and you intend to, to hack the system. Be careful. If there is no VDP program, you are actually breaking the law. So even if you find something and you try to report it to them, they might turn around and say, hey, look, you just hacked my system without my consent. So be very careful. Yeah? Do not indulge in ethical hacking or whatever hacking you might call it unless they have a VDP program or a BBP program or a VRP program. Yeah, um, Google has a VRP very popular uh, uh, platform, you know, you, you earn thousands of dollars if you find a critical program in, in, in their systems. Obviously, it's quite tough, yeah, but always ensure there is at least a VDP in scope, else don't go there, <laughs> all right? Um, can you share a sample pen test report? I would think we can, but we have to, um, we have to redact a lot of the information. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to, to the organizers after this to, to see if that's possible. Um, third question, could you suggest some free penetration testing labs? Are there plenty out there? Um, the most popular one I, I really love, um, me personally, I, I like to go to the, uh, Port Swinger Academy. Um, there, there are a lot of, um, uh, tutorials, uh, exercises there. Um, for those who play CTF, there's Try Hack Me, Van Hub. Um, they, they, they are, there's just plenty out there. Uh, but I, I personally, uh, for web hacking, I, I, I like the uh, Port Swinger uh, Web Academy. And what else do we have here? Um, how, how to detect vulnerability while developing software Parallelly. All right, this, this is kind of a tough question for us to, to answer. Um, we, we are mainly pen testers. So we, we do the uh, pen testing usually at the end of the cycle of, of the program before it goes, in, go, before it goes live. Um, so if you ask me how to detect vulnerabilities while developing software parallelly, uh, that is a DevOps question. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't have much uh, experience in that area. Um, so I, I can't really uh, answer that. 
And the last question, um, could you suggest that link? Uh, I'm not sure which, which link uh, are you referring to? Okay, the next question coming in from the same person. You mentioned the free penetration testing labs. All right, um, so it's web, um, pot swinger. Let me just type it here. All right, you just Google for that, uh, Pot Swinger Web Academy. Can we do this on virtual machine or do we need to have installed Kali as a bare metal? Um, usually we, we, have, um, we have two parts. We download the, the, um, the CMS and we install it in a virtual machine such as Debian or Ubuntu. And then we have our own Kali instance at the site to, to do the pen testing. Any more questions? Ah, it's more coming in. What are the skills required to get into pen testing? Um, so to get into pen testing, right? Um, the old, I think the main, the most important skill is to have uh, interest uh, and um, your Google, your Google foo. <laughs> the answers are all on the internet. So if you know how to Google for it, you will get the answers. Um, the most important skill I, I, I still say is interest, um, the will to learn new things. Um, there are just so many material out there, so, so many um, websites, blogs, um, Twitter groups, um, you know, join those groups um, and yeah, take part and, and learn from the community. Next question, do you have any favorite tools in bug bounty or pen test? Uh, definitely for me personally would be um, the, um, a burp suite. Um, I'll ask the same question to Azrul and Aiden. Do you have any other stuff that you like to use? Uh, most of the time, if uh, involved web application, I will use burp suite also. Yeah, same. The, the, yeah. I think the web security testing, the extension tool will be burp suite. Uh, we will use the most. Yeah. Yep. Same here too. Is there any cases duplicated whereby someone already reported? The same CVE, huh? Good question. So far, I believe no. Correct, um, Azri, uh, sorry, Azrul and uh, Aiden. Uh, no. Did we get any clash? No, no. For VDP, so far, no, no clashes, yeah. Really yeah. No. Mainly because we we chose programs that are not too popular at the same time active. Yeah, that that's why we were quite lucky in a sense. If we were to choose programs that are very popular. Yeah, maybe very highly likely we, we would have got into duplicates. What is the difference between pen testing, ethical hacking? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, it's, just, it's just a buzzword. Um, ethical hacking would mean that um, you're doing it in a responsible manner. Um, pen testing, with pen testing, we are mainly looking for um, common vulnerabilities. Um, we don't necessarily produce POCs. Sometimes we do. But the POCs are very surface level. For example, for XSS, we just do a pop-up. Um, for ethical hacking, you might want to show more impact. So on the XSS, you might want to show that I could siphon a, a cookie. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could send this uh, cookie off to a third party and therefore take over the site. So I say ethical hacking has um, a broader sense of, of impact to show. Whereas pen testing, you just show like uh, proof of concept, you know, or sometimes even no proof of concept, but um, we, we show that there is a vulnerability there. Yeah. What else? There's a lot of questions here. Um, for the purpose, for the pro proposed CVE, how do you calculate the severity? Uh, good question. Um, the, the CVEs that we submit, uh, usually um, the impact is calculated by the program owner. So we, we will just give our, our recommendation uh, based on, on our judgment. But in the end, it will be the program owner to, to make the decision whether it's high, medium, low, or informational. How would you explain a vulnerability to the developer who have created sites? All right, so how do you explain a vulnerability to a developer? That's a very good question also. Um, it, this is the part where we call um, consultancy business um, because we do this every day, <laughs> five days a week, and we, we kind of get um, the hang of it. 
um, initially is is all about pen testing and reporting the vulnerabilities. But in uh, later we learned that um, we have to find ways to um, show the vulnerabilities and how we show the vulnerabilities. Um, we usually do a POC. Um, we try to sh to show the POC live. Yeah. For example, uh, if we find an SQL injection on on on, uh, on a software, we will immediately inform the the client. And and uh, instead of you know waiting for the report at the end of the day, and we we show them immediately and say, hey, look, you know, I can I can uh, inject uh, and, and I can pull data from from your system. And when they see it live, then they're like, oh, okay, <laughs> we have to fix this, you know. So we don't wait until the report because the report is the tail end of the project, and then they say, ah, you know, can you show me again? And, it's a bit cumbersome to, you, to go back to, 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 to that point and, and show them. So immediately, we, we, if it's something big, something critical, we show them immediately. And, and that usually uh, helps because it, it creates the impact and the urgentness. How, uh, who provides the CVE numbers? All right, then another good question. Um, the CVE numbers are usually assigned uh, by uh, Mitre, yeah, the Mitre organization. Um, there are instances where the CVEs are actually uh, uh, seconded to the program owner. So if you have any programs that operate on, for example, GitHub, if the, pro, uh, if the platform owner, the, the, the software owner has used GitHub to, to um, uh, develop the, the, the software lifecycle, um, there, there is an option for them to participate in the CVE. And they can actually actively uh, give the CVE to the researcher. In that instance, it's actually beneficial for the researcher because the researcher doesn't have to register the CVE with Mitre, because Mitre is a large organization, and I mean, I mean, they, they have a lot of CVEs coming in every day, requests coming in every day, and there are times when they, you know, you do not know who are the CNAs, who are the proper authority to go to, and it gets lost. The, the request gets lost. So very much, we like to target programs that are already on GitHub that are participating in the CVEs. That's the best because that's the fastest to get the CVE as opposed to, to trying to register the CVE yourself, Dimitri. And uh, another question here, uh, which certificate is good for hardware security, IoT security? Um, that's a good question. Um, fortunately, I don't have the uh, security researcher here with me. Um, he's based in Australia. Um, he could answer that question for you, but I, I, I do not know. <laughs> Okay, I, I guess we went through all the questions already. Uh. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks so much. Now that will be the end of the session. Uh, I would like to thank uh, three of you. That was such an informative and wonderful session. Uh, we really had a great time listening to your experience and its system tools. And I'm also sure to see you in your future activities too. And thank I would you, also Amir. like to uh, thank the, each one of your audience for your active participation in the event and the panel themselves once again for spending your valuable time with us. Now we are also going to about to begin our next section by Mr. Rahul Tyagi. Uh, before moving on, I would also like to give a shout out to our community partners, Advisory Village, Coffee with Red Team, ASRG, Cyber Peace Foundation, Shell, uh, Computer Society of India, Cyber Flat, Defcom, our uh, media partners, Bluepin and Secure Reading, our uh, event organizers, Red Team Hacker Academy and Red Team Sec uh, Cyber Security Labs. Uh, our supporting partners, CapFit, Cyberdome, Caricate, Government Cyberpark, Code Coder, GTech, and Fiat. And last, our tech partners, Hacktables. Thank you so much, sir. That was such a wonderful section. And thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye.